Okay, over to you. Okay, so um, my name is Jenny Izzell, fairly obviously. Um, I am, um, I'm a PhD candidate at Durham University, is probably the most significant thing here. I'm studying for my doctorate on contemporary British Druidry and death rituals. Um, I'm a Druid and when I'm not being a PhD student, I'm a part-time PhD student, when I'm not, I'm a religious education consultant. I taught religious education in secondary school for a, a lot of years and mostly what I do now is write exam papers, GCSEs and A-levels and manage the teams that lead them. Um, I'm also, my partner and I own what we refer to as a progressive funeral home in Darlington in the north of England. Uh, people will insist on calling us an alternative funeral home, which really annoys me because nothing that we do ought to be alternative. Um, but we have a, a slightly different attitude, I suppose, towards funeral directing. Um, and that's, that's me, really, I suppose. So on my last talk, um, where I left it was that I saw paganism or paganisms, as some scholars refer to it, um, as a family of religions with, or a family of religious traditions might be a better way of putting it rather than religions, as I said last time, with a familial relationship to each other. And that they are filled with people and what those people are doing is religioning. And I explained that I prefer this term religioning. It comes from a scholar called Mallory Nye um, because he says that religions with clearly defined dogmas and boundaries between them is not actually how human beings behave. It just isn't. Um, and that religioning activities are activities that, in the words of the scholar Douglas Ezzy, enable people to live lives endowed with well-being and meaning and purpose. Um, and I said that these pagan religious traditions share certain family characteristics that would enable people to recognize them as pagan and that those characteristics included but were not limited to things like a belief in the innate divinity or sanctity of nature understood differently uh, that they're not strictly monotheistic. Um, now that doesn't mean that there aren't pagans who are certainly monist or pantheist and who see everything that exists as an expression of divinity. That's quite a common pagan view. But the idea of one personal God is not a common one in paganism and where it does exist, it tends to be expressed in the feminine as a goddess. Uh, and I said that a corollary of this is that whereas monotheistic religions are sometimes almost trapped in this position where if I'm right, you must be wrong, that within the pagan traditions, it is perfectly possible to say I'm right and you're right, even when our ideas conflict with each other. Um, and we talked about that a little bit. Um, Also, I said that pagan religions are engaged in a project of re-enchantment. And I said that one of the things that Graham Harvey had said in his introduction to his book, well, introduction to the book, Celebrating Planet Earth, which came out of a conference where certain Christians and certain pagans engaged with each other over a weekend to find points in common. And in his introduction to this book, he said that if the defining characteristic of Christianity could be seen as salvation, then the defining characteristic of paganism is in re-enchantment, in this idea of bringing back a sense of magic into the world. Now, the word magic is hugely problematic. It is more problematic, it's as problematic as words like religion and God and soul, which are trust me on this hugely problematic words and I'm not going to dwell on it too much here it means different things to different pagans and it has a different place in different pagan traditions 
but some engagement with the concept of magic, which is a talk all in its own right, is one of the defining characteristics of the family of religious traditions that is paganism. So the different pagan traditions are constantly borrowing ideas and practices from each other and from elsewhere. So modern paganism developed mostly in countries where the background tradition and culture and way of looking at the world either was or had grown out of Christianity. And therefore we shouldn't be surprised, although it might be a bit controversial to say it, that paganism has borrowed heavily from Christianity. Um, and that of course is a two way thing. In um, the Hellenistic world in the second and third centuries, there's evidence that there was quite a bit of exchange between early Christianity and established pagan traditions. In Britain, the early Christians continued and adopted practices that had been there when Christianity first arrived. And in the time that has passed, there has been a two-way conversation, I think, between Christian and pre-Christian traditions. And as pre-Christian traditions have re-emerged, and that's again a controversial thing to say, uh, into modern paganism, or at least have inspired mo modern paganism. And I think that's a very safe position, that most modern pagan traditions take inspiration from a pre-Christian past. Um, that pagans have adopted things from Christianity, as well as vice versa. There is, for example, very little evidence that in antiquity, Samhain was anything to do with the dead. That is probably something that has genuinely come from Christianity and has grown to be a deeply meaningful uh, festival and tradition within paganism. Uh, I also said that I preferred to use the word religious rather than spiritual and that I realised that that is also very controversial um, based on a number of things and that includes my personal position on animism but also this concept of religioning, that people do religion. It's a verb, it's a performative thing, it's a collective thing. It's not primarily an intellectual thing. However, paganism certainly seem different to many of the traditions that we think of as religions, and particularly the religions that we think of as world religions. The concept of world religions probably starts with the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago. Uh, I think it was in 1897, but I may be wrong about that date. Um, and then is developed in the 1960s by the scholar Ninian Smart. And it, it really characterized, uh, characterized religions that have a global presence and certain key characteristics. And paganism generally lacks those characteristics. So for example, while there are founders in some traditions, Wicca and Druidry spring to mind, and I'm talking, remember, of the modern traditions here, um, that certainly isn't the case generally for the religious traditions, and it's not one of the important things about them. There's no clear leadership or hierarch hierarchical structure of authority. Now, of course, that can also be said of other religions. And again, Hinduism is the, the one that is often compared with paganism. Um, it's also true of some types of Christianity uh, and not of others. There's no clearly defined set of beliefs or dogmas. We don't have anything that um, approaches a credo. And that, as I said last week, I think arises out of the fact that belief, what you believe, is not of central importance in paganism in the way that it is in some other religions and specifically in post-enlightenment Protestant Christianity. So if it's not from these things, if it's not from scripture, which is another big defining characteristic of world religion, where do beliefs ideas, attitudes, where do they come from within Hinduism? Where is the body of tradition? Well, there is a body of tradition, of course. There are people's experiences passed on. There is also um, something we hear a lot about at the moment within certain pagan traditions, certainly, and which seems to be gaining a degree of traction. And this is the concept of the UPG, the unverified personal gnosis, um, which is something that is vouch, vouchsafed to an individual through a religious experience or um, some form of an encounter with the divine in a trance state 
which they take to be indicative of the true state of affairs, which has um, some sort of veracity to it. Um, the unverified is significant here because obviously, unlike other religions, in paganism, there's very little that you can test this against. People have these experiences in most religions. I'm going to go out on a limb and say every religion because I think this sort of religious experience, whatever the true source of it, is part of what it means to be a human being. And I think William James's book on the varieties of religious experience pretty much establishes this fact. Whatever this is, it happens to a lot of people enough that we can say it is a, a normal part of being a human being. Not all religions call it this. A lot of religions talk about revelations or visions. Um, one of the um, very well-known examples within Christianity is the vision of Mother Julian of Norwich. And the difference is that within Christianity and certainly with Mother Julian's experience, there is something to test it against. And in her case, this proved to some extent problematic um, because there was an established body, not only of tradition, there was an established source of authority in the Catholic Church, and there was also an established body of scripture against which it could be compared. Now, in paganism, we don't really have any of those things. And therefore, the role of um, unverified personal gnosis can be very difficult. You can have people saying, well, that doesn't agree with mine. And again, ultimately, I don't think it matters because belief is not the center of the matter. I do think it's interesting though to look just briefly at that last word, gnosis. It's usually translated into English as knowledge, but this is one of those occasions where English falls short to some extent, because in English, we only have the one word for knowledge. In most languages, there's a lot of words for knowledge. And what gnosis, which also appears in Hindu thinking as gyan, what that word means is a knowledge that is deeply embodied and felt. It's not something that can be learned from a book. And um, I think that is also really important when we're talking about UPGs. This is a knowledge that almost becomes a part of who you are. And that certainly is something that is playing a role in the development of ideas about what is and isn't true within paganism. There is also this idea that whilst I said last week, and it is absolutely true that paganism is essentially relational within that idea that the pagan is a, a being, an organism that is in a mesh of relationships with other things and with a larger than human world, there is also very much the idea that the individual takes responsibility for themselves. They take responsibility for their beliefs, they take responsibility for their relationship with their gods or their concept of the divine or the world, and they take responsibility for their own personal morality. Um, now, one of the things that we can't compare UPGs to for verification is scripture. And one of the things that is almost characteristic of paganism is this lack of scripture. Now, we have books. We do have some books. Um, the obvious examples here is that in Wicca, there is the Book of Shadows or Joel Gardner's original Book of Shadows. Um, but this is not necessarily seen to have the status of scripture and the idea is very much de developed within Wicca as I understand it that individuals develop their own book of shadows and their own relationship with what they're experiencing and what they're learning which is ultimately of greater value than that original one. Um, in Druidry we have the Bardas. Um, the Bardas was either written or translated, depending on how you look at it. Um, my view is that it was written by Yola Maganog in the late 1700s. Um, it's a beautiful text and a lot of the liturgy and the ritual and the original 
beliefs of Druidry, although these have largely changed or developed, come from the Bardas. But it's not, even if you take it as translations of ancient documents, it's not presented as being divinely revealed and it is not presented as being authoritative in the way that scripture is seen as authoritative. Probably the only thing that exists within paganism that is even comparable are the poetic and the prose edda in heathenry and uh, the Havamal as well to some extent. Um, now these are seen by some heathens as something approaching scripture and I have seen um, heathens discussing somebody's UPG and saying well that can't be right because that contradicts what it says in the Edda. Um, I'm deeply suspicious of that approach to the Eddas largely because they were written by Christians and this is what separates them very clearly from anything that would be recognized as scripture in a different religion. The prose and poetic Eddas are an attempt to preserve pre-Christian Icelandic, specifically Icelandic religion and culture. And they're written down in the 13th century by monks. So already they have been through a gloss um, and they don't get us back to the original religion before Christianity had an impact on it. Which is not to say that they're not valuable, they're hugely valuable, but that's not what they are. And just as an aside here, I would say that I don't think such a thing exists as a pure religion that has not been changed or changed religions that it comes into contact with. It is the nature of religions that they borrow and take from each other. And what you have in the Eddas is um, pre-Christian Icelandic religion as it was seen by the monks about 200 years after it was last practiced. Um, and how they have put their gloss onto things in the light of their own Christian teaching is at least as interesting as anything else that's in there. Another source of knowledge that I think is, is quite, uh, quite an interesting one to look at is ritual. And I am arguing here that ritual is in and of itself a source of knowledge. So um, we've tended to have here a again and I come back to this post-enlightenment Protestant view of ritual that it is something that if you're not very careful becomes meaningless through repetition that it becomes dead because it replaces if you're not very careful an active and living relationship with the divine and another idea that we have about ritual is that it always points to something else so that all of the objects, all of the words, all of the actions that take place during a ritual symbolize or point towards something beyond themselves. Um, again, I'm going to take issue with that idea of ritual. And I think very often in paganism, what is happening in ritual is something very different. And two examples of that, one is um, Graham Harvey um, in his, the latest book that he has edited, which is Indigenizing Movements in Europe, um, which is a fantastic book, I recommend it strongly. Um, he says that ritual can be seen as enactments of interpersonal and often interspecies relationality. So in other words, you are acting out this sense of being connected, being connected with the other people that you are in ritual with, if it's a group ritual, being connected with entities that you are engaging in ritual with, be they gods, be they spirits of place, be they ancestors, or be they the animals that happen to be in the space where you are doing the ritual if you're outside. Um, another thing that is very interesting, um, a scholar in Leeds, Tasia Scruton, is talking about in, now this is from a book called Continuing Bonds in Bereavement, and she is looking in, in this chapter, she is looking specifically at the ways people use ritual in bereavement. 
and she takes two examples one is from an indigenous religion and one is about druidry in britain and she talks about a kind of knowledge that you only gain from being in ritual that is essentially different from anything that is learnt intellectually there are things that you only know by doing them now we all know that there is such a thing as muscle memory that there are types of knowledge that have nothing to do with the intellect but she here is talking about something like the gnosis of the um, upg she's talking about types of understanding and i would suggest relating this to what harvey has to say types of relationality and types of being in relationship that can only be experienced through ritual and that cannot be learned in any other way so i'm going to suggest that whereas in some religions there is a body of scripture there is a body of belief that is widely acknowledged even if not everybody following that religion would actually adheres to it and um, some sort of structural authority that in paganism what we have we have certain writings and they are sources of inspiration i think rather than authority but we also have these upgs which have a particular status within paganism and we also have what is learnt through doing, what is learnt through being in community and what is learnt through ritual. So the other thing that you see in most of what we think of as the world religions is a set of ethics. Um, and often this is based on what in ethical theory, which is another one of my areas, is called divine command theory. So in other words, whether something is right or wrong, is based on whether a god says it is right or wrong so this is very much the basis of islamic ethics um, in christianity and judaism there are the ten commandments so there are, are clear rules that have been laid down um, it's not the only thing that that feeds into christian ideas of ethics by any means but it is there now this is pretty much i think completely absent in paganism even where pagans are in relationship with deity or in relationship with gods there doesn't tend to be this this is morally right because god says so and there is also the idea that when one is in a relationship with a god that that is transactional that is relational and that the responsibility for what you do or don't do is very much on you um, so you may choose to carry out something that a god has asked you to do or you may choose to turn that down and that is entirely reasonable but at the end of the day the decision about what is right and wrong rests with you as an individual um, there are pagan traditions that have precepts um, ideas of guidance the the obvious one is the the wiccan idea of and it harms none do as you will but what that actually does again if you think of it it's not a rule what it does is it puts the responsibility back onto the individual what are the consequences of this action now this is something in ethical theory that is called consequentialism or um teleological ethics and the idea behind that is that you decide whether something is right or wrong based on its consequences now the problem of course is that you can't always tell what the consequences of an action are in paganism i would say that the majority of pagans certainly the majority of pagans that i've spoken to broadly speaking follow the theory that we would call virtue ethics uh, now this is something we first encounter with aristotle in ancient greece and it starts from the idea that the world is a complicated place and that black and white pretty much don't exist you're always dealing in shades of gray so that ethical decisions are likely to be a case of finding the best thing to do rather than the right thing to do because there might not be a clear right thing to do so rather than developing a set of guidelines do this don't do that if a then b uh, virtue ethics rests on the idea that you develop certain qualities 
practice that you make yourself through repetition into a certain type of person. You develop what in anthropological terms would be called a habitus. And that this character that you develop by consciously nurturing and developing characteristics such as compassion, honour, truthfulness, um, and that if you practice those skills, they will slowly become who you are. And if you become that character, then faced with a complicated ethical decision, you will make a decision based on who you are. Now, that might not be the only good decision that it's possible to take, but it is a good decision given the limitations of the situ situation that you're in. Uh, and the idea of um, pagan ethics has been discussed by various pagan authors, including probably most famously Emma Restall Orr in her book, Living with Honour, and um, Brendan Myers in his book, The Earth, the Gods and the Soul. And both of those books broadly espouse the idea of virtue ethics. So in terms of how the outside world sees religion and what religion is, that um, would be my idea of how paganism fits into those characteristics, where it positions itself within that broad scope of, of thinking that is religion. So if paganism is defined more or less by what people do rather than by who by what people believe so what do pagans do um probably the most well-known obvious thing that you're going to to come across is ritual now ritual can be private it can be something that somebody does on their own in their own house it can be based with their family or it can be public and if it is public, it can be open to anybody who wants to come, or it can be open only to members of a particular tradition, a particular coven, a particular grove. Um, now, this is where we see the familiar traditions again, the familiar relationships between pagan families. So what does a pagan ritual look like? Well, it depends very much on what type of pagan ritual it is but i would suggest that if you go to an open ritual in britain calling itself generic pagan um, or at a site celebrating a festival uh, i'm thinking of thornborough henge here at beltane or um avebury then it is likely to involve a circle and it is likely to involve calling the quarters in some way or another. Um, so that is an invitation to the north, the south, the east and the west to um, create sacred space and to participate in the ritual. Now, how the quarters are addressed will change between traditions. In Britain, there is a convention that the north is associated with the element of earth, the east with the element of air, the south with the element of fire, and the west with the element of water. And that those things have certain things associated with them. So with the east, the air is associated with, uh, with um, intellect, with clear thought, the south with ambition, passion, drive, the west with emotion, and the north, um, sometimes with death, sometimes with um, just the earth and resting and conservation of energy. Those are not universal connections. Um, in Druidry, the quarters are associated with animals as well. So the bear for the north, the hawk for the east, the stag for the south and the salmon for the west. And they, of course, have their own associations with them. Um, some druid groups don't use the elements they use the earth the sea and the sky instead and some druid groups rather than using the associations with intellect and emotion and so on use um irish associations where for example the north is the place of war and conflict uh the south is i think the place of um magic 
the east is associated with wealth and material well-being and the west is associated with the arts i think i may be wrong on that but there is the general idea of the um calling the quarters uh, often a raising of energy in some way that might be done through chanting it might be done through drumming might be done through dancing and that that energy is then directed towards a specific purpose which might be very often the healing of the land particular piece of land or um, towards peace or towards something else but those are the things you are likely to see at public open pagan rituals that don't have a particular label associated with them. Um, there are, of course, other formats. Heathenry is, again, significantly different. And the main thing associated with heathen ritual is the symbol or feast. And again, there is this idea of sharing and relationality and creating a bond between a human community and a divine community. What you do tend to find with pretty much all pagan ritual, um, wherever it is, is that it is highly performative and that it actively in, involves all the participants. So it is not one person standing at the front doing things. It is everybody that is there actively involved in doing things, even if, it's, even if it is just standing in a circle. There, they are actively doing something and most people in a ritual will usually have something to do. Um, many pagans have a personal practice, they will have a shrine, or very often they'll spend time in some form of meditation, is another very common practice within Hinduism. And again, this might involve music, it might involve drumming, it might involve chanting, it might involve a rattle, it might involve just sitting and being still. Um, a lot of pagans, it just involves sitting somewhere outside and losing, I suppose, the boundaries of yourself as an individual and feeling yourself as being totally a relational part of everything that is going on around you. Um, you'll find a lot of pagans at various camps and festivals throughout the year, not this year, obviously, which is unfortunate. But in an average year, there are many, many different camps and festivals throughout the year. And these places, um, Andy Lecture in his PhD thesis suggested that these places were heterotropic. That is places that for a short period of time are turned into something out of the ordinary, something away from the normal world where different relationships between pagans and with the divine and the natural world around them, those different relationships can be formed. Now, there are several scholarly works that talk about something called neo-tribalism. So obviously a lot of anthropological work in the past, 100, 150 years or so, looked at tribalism. And usually it was looking at tribes in different countries and the tribes in question had certain characteristics they were geographically close to each other they were united by a belief system they were united under certain types of authority and certain activities now british society clearly doesn't work like that but certain anthropologists uh zagmat bowman and mafasoli in particular um suggested that in the postmodern world tribes still operate but they operate in a different way and Mafasoli for example says that these new tribes are not characterized necessarily by geographical closeness and people drop in and out of them they don't endure in the way that some of the anthropologically based tribes did uh, but that the relationships between them otherwise are largely tribal and I think I would agree with that. And I think I would also suggest that a lot of um, pagan communities function as these neo-tribes. Where I think I disagree with Mafasoli is where he says that they, they are bounded in time. They don't last. People drop in and out of them. My experience is that although people can move between these tribes, actually those tribal relationships remain very strong. 
over decades sometimes. Um, and that will be that will be something that will be interesting to see as time goes on. Um, certainly with um, Druidry as it exists at the moment, which I would say has existed in its present form for decades rather than anything else. It will be interesting to see how those tribal relationships continue into new decades. Um, so we have these, these sort of heterotropic camp and festival spaces where the pagan tribes express themselves as tribes in a way that they often can't. Now, at the time when Mefasoli was writing, the, um, the internet was just about beginning to exist, but it wasn't anything like it was, it is now. And I would also suggest that this tribalism is something that is developed online in ways that I don't think have really been studied as yet, and certainly in regards to paganism. And it would be interesting to do that. So... What else do pagans do? The, the other thing that is perhaps well known is um, the wheel of the year. And again, this does not apply to all pagans. It tends to apply to um, pagans that have some association with a Celtic worldview, be that Wicca, witchcraft, um, shamanistic practices, druidry, uh, heathens tend not to follow the, the wheel of the year except in certain places where there's a, a correlation such as Yule um, and obviously if you're following a Kemetic or a Sumerian path or a Hellenistic path there are f festival structures already existing there. Now the wheel of the year is fascinating because um, as I said last week Ronald Hutton um, describes pagan, pagan religions as having roots in an ancient past, but being superbly suited for modern society, which I think is an, a genius way of describing paganism. And this is a perfect example of this. The wheel of the year is a modern thing. It has its roots in the past, insofar as every individual part of it was celebrated by some group of people at some point in the past. Um, it's a modern thing, in that it seems to have been put together as a proposed structure for the celebration of festivals by Gerald Gardner and Ross Nichols um, sometime in the 1950s, 1960s. And um, it suits modern needs very well. Uh, it gives you a festival every six weeks or so, which is very nice. And it gives you a way of fitting in a ritual year not only with the natural world so that you remain in, in tune with the turnings of the seasons in the natural world but also with the the wider world so it gives you a celebration around christmas which culturally is a useful thing to have um, it does not appear that there was any time in the ancient past where there existed a group of people or a place that celebrated all of these festivals so to that extent, it's modern. However, as I said, each of the individual parts of it have a past. Um, and very often that past is this wonderful, rich syncretism I was talking about earlier between Christianity and pre-Christian traditions. And I do see that as a really rich thing that is to be celebrated rather than a case of who's stealing from who. Um, so, for example, the solstices and possibly the equinoxes seem to have been important to the Neolithic people. So we have ancient monuments, West Kennet, Stonehenge, Avebury and so on, that are aligned to solstices and occasionally to equinoxes. So this is what was important to them, it seems. Um, when we get towards the Iron Age and the Celts, these people seem to be celebrating the fire festivals, as we call them. And these festivals seem to be deeply connected to what is going on in agriculture. They're connected to farming or they're correct, connected to the, the husbandry of animals. So um, when we put together the Wheel of the Year, we're looking to some extent at what two different sets of ancestors were doing, which is fine. Um, and it gives us a connection back to both of those sets. Um, 
of course, it's not universally accepted. And another problem with the Wheel of the Year is that in its modern form, it doesn't always match what the seasons are doing. So um, Beltane in the northeast of England, for example, very rarely coincides with the May Blossom coming out, which for quite a lot of pagans is the event that marks Beltane for them. Um, so a lot of pagans don't use the traditional dates um, from the Wheel of the Year. They actually follow what is happening in the nature that are, is around them, um, which makes perfect sense. So the Wheel of the Year, for those that don't know, and I am aware that most of you do, and as I said last time, I, I apologise to the extent that I appear to be teaching grandmothers to suck eggs here. Uh, I'm aware that most of the people here are pagan and that they know this better than I do. I know that there are some people here who are not, and this is to some extent for their benefit. So, um, midwinter, winter solstice, around the 21st of December in the Northern Hemisphere, and it tends to be associated for many pagans with the idea either of the rebirth of the sun or with the birth of a sacred child of some kind. Um, now, the extent to which this predates Christmas is difficult to know. There are, of course, Middle Eastern traditions, for example, the birth of Mithras and the birth of the younger Horus in Egypt are connected with this time of year. Um, the Mabon in Britain is the obvious example, but everything we know about the Mabon comes from after the, the dawn of Christianity. So it's difficult to be sure, but for a lot of pagans, there is a divine child associated with the winter solstice. It's a time of reflection and also of feasting. It's a time of relationship and family. Um, many pagan families have a Yule log, which is something that comes from, certainly from the Middle Ages, possibly longer, we don't know. Mistletoe, very distinctively associated with the winter solstice, of course. And that is something that we do know was associated with the Druids through the writings of Pliny. Um, but we don't know that it was associated by the Druids with this time of year. Uh, for a lot of pagans, of course, the, the, the ritual here is a symbolic battle. I have used the word symbolic, haven't I, when I was talking about ritual? A battle between the Oak King and the Holly King which marks the beginning of the turn away from the light, oh, sorry, away from the dark and towards the light half of the year. Uh, the next festival, Imolk, uh, around the 2nd of February, um, is associated with the very first stirrings of spring and the birth of the first lambs, which is etymologically connected to the name of the festival. Um, for many, this is a fire festival, again associated with fire, and there are festivals where fires are lit. Um, it's associated also very strongly with the goddess Brigid, um, who of course for Christians is a saint. And this is one of the very interesting places where we see Christianity and paganism touching and an exchange both ways. You can say that um, Brigid was such a great goddess that the Christians couldn't defeat her, so they assimilated her as a saint. That is certainly one way of looking at it. Or you can say that she was somebody to whom both pagans and Christians could relate, and that that gave her the, the power that continued her on into Christianity. And many of the customs associated with Imbolc are connected with Brigid, and many of them are medieval, which means that the knowledge we have of them comes from Christian times, which is really interesting. And they involve very often processing a bridey doll through the streets uh, and putting her into a cradle overnight, putting out pieces of cloth to be blessed by her, which can then be used for healing, uh, and leaving out offerings typically of dairy products to her. And um, in the medieval time, it was quite common to hold a feast for the poor and the homeless uh, in honour of Bridget as well. Now, spring equinox, sometimes known as Astara, this is a tricky one because we have very little evidence for this being an ancient pagan festival. There is the reference to Ostra by Bede, um, of course, famously, 
but he says nothing else about this goddess uh, other than that cakes are baked for her. So we know so little. Uh, it's possible that there was a Germanic goddess that was celebrated at this time, even probable, but we don't know much about her. And it's probably not one of the bigger pagan festivals. It's celebrated, but it's, it's probably not one of the more important. Unlike Beltane, which is the next at around the 1st of May, and probably one of the most significant pagan festivals, and interestingly, one that is not doesn't sit alongside a Christian festival particularly. Uh, there's May Day, of course, um, and there's the bank holiday of May Day associated with Labour Day, but there is no particular Christian festival at the same time as Beltane. Um, it celebrates the beginning of summer. It probably marks the time at which the cattle were taken up to the pastures during transhumance. They're driven between two fires. Uh, for purification. It's very strongly associated this with um, wildfires, with Hawthorne, um, and I would say it's quite probable that most of the celebrations uh, that exist for Beltane do go back to pre-Christian roots, even though the evidence we have for them is sometimes medieval at best, and of course, the big problem we have is that the Victorians were very keen on regenerating ancient pagan festivals um, and they made up as much as they didn't. So it's very difficult to know what actually goes back and what comes from Victorian romanticism, which doesn't make it mean that it isn't a powerful and important stuff. It's just really difficult to know what's ancient and what isn't. Um, but this does seem to be associated with fairs. It seems to be associated with a time for marriages, uh, a time for trade deals. And um, again, just a celebration of fertility in the beginning of spring, of summer. Midsummer, Litha, around the 21st of June. Um, again, there's not a lot of specific, of specific ancient evidence. There doesn't seem to be a lot of agricultural significance here. There may have been quite a lot of summer fairs going on, although again, looking at the evidence, that seems to be more common um, around Lamas or Lunasa on the 1st of August, um, where there, there tends to be a lot of fairs and sporting events, and these are reflected in the, uh, the Toyn and the Book of Invasions and the, the medieval Irish sources that we have for this. Um, at Litha at Midsummer, again, there is a battle enacted in some pagan traditions where the Holly King defeats the Oak King and the year tilts back towards the dark. Um, so the next festival is Lamas and Lanassa around the 1st of August. Seems to have been a time for fairs, sporting events, and again, it's a time when business deals are made, where people are hired, uh, marriages, all of this sort of thing. It's the first harvest, the harvest of the, um, usually of the crops, the wheat, the oats, the barley, and therefore associated with corn dollies, which are again associated with paganism, but we don't know. It would be a logical thing to assume goes back pre-Christian, but we can't say that with any certainty. Then um, next is the autumn equinox, which some pagans call Mabon around the 21st of September. Again, there's very little ancient evidence for this, except it seems to signify the start of autumn. And the, um, again, it's a time of harvest. Um, as at the spring equinox, pagans might well be thinking about balance in the world, in themselves, in their own lives. This tends to be a focus. And then Samhain, the second great fire festival around the 1st of November. Samhain means summer's end. Uh, it signifies the beginning of winter in the Celtic calendar. Again, it's very common to light a fire. Um, now, for many pagans, Samhain is the time to remember and honour the ancestors, both ancient and more recent. Uh, traditions in modern paganism include things like holding a silent feast, where um, a meal is eaten in silence with a place set for a dead member of the family. 
uh, others hold some sort of memorial event or some sort of service for the dead and it tends to be a very quiet and reflective time. Um, like Beltane, it's very often associated with divination. This is a time to be, it's a time when for a lot of pagans, the veil between this world and however you conceive of the other world is very thin. And so this is a time for connecting with ancestors and it's a time for divination. Um, for some pagans, it's the time of the new year. Um, there is actually, I think, pretty much no evidence that that was the case in antiquity. Um, just like there's no evidence that it was particular, was that is actually more likely to have been Beltane than Samhain. But because of the Catholic festival of All Hallows and All Saints, which did bring in the aspects of the dead around Halloween, um, my feeling, at least, and again, I know this is controversial, is that that is the route through which paganism came to this association with the dead. And it has become, obviously, this huge festival of the dead for paganism in a very powerful and a very meaningful way. So I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I hope what I've done is that I've given some sort of a overview of what paganism is and how it fits into a wider sociological and anthropological understanding of religion what religions are what religions do and whether um, paganism or to what extent paganism fits into that category so i'm going to finish there and if if anybody has any questions or comments i'd be uh, more than happy to take them Looks like you've got your first one from Kevin. Hello, right. Maybe a tricky one. You talked a lot about gaps, and there's a lot of gaps in paganism. Now, I'm lucky, I'm a Kemetic, so I have a lot of religious texts to work with, mm -hmm. yep. but I still have gaps. Yep. So, my question what would be that what you would love to be found? <laughs> in the biggest gap you know like the user guide to Stonehenge you know? <laughs> good question it's an excellent question it's an excellent question and yes it's a very tricky one um, I'm going to give you a very personal answer because my area of study is very much around death and death ritual and um, uh, I, I focus a lot on these new barrows that are being built for cremated remains and how they fit into a wider picture of understanding landscape and mourning and bereavement. So if there was one gap that I would like to be filled, I would like to know exactly what the Neolithic people were doing with long barrows, what they thought they were doing, what the relationship between the ancestors and the people was and how it was embodied in those barrows that's the thing that i would like to know because i have not got a clue brilliant well i know here here's, here's an idea i live in the in dover and on the hills the spurs of all the hills into the valley are long barrows that mm -hmm. in neolithic times would have been brilliant white yeah and you would have been able to see them for miles so statement <laughs> yeah and the, the way, I mean, people are, it looks like excarnated bodies are going into these barrows. Bits of them are being taken out and used for something and then put back in different orders. There's one place where there's a more or less articulated skeleton, but the leg bone is the wrong way around. There are human remains built into the structure of them. And I, I just, I would just like to know what the hell was going on. I really would. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Kevin, and thanks for that great response. Okay, do we have any more questions? Just wave your hand if, if you've got one. Well, okay, looks like everybody's been thoroughly satisfied. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Who was that, Chaz? This is Ian Nodwick here. Oh, hi, um, Ian. <laughs> hi. Hello, Ian. Um, Where are you? <laughs> I think he's hiding behind Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> yep. So you touched on the um, on the subject of morality earlier on. Yeah. And um, one of the things I noticed is that. Um, you didn't mention good or evil, which seems to be quite a big thing in a lot of other um, religions. Um, you any is is there that sort of concept within um, within paganism? Oh, that's a tricky one, and it's a tricky one because there are going to be so many different opinions. Um, my feeling is that for most pagans, again, like so many other things, it's relational. Not that there is some sort of disembodied absolute standard of good and some sort of disembodied absolute standard of evil, but that those things consist in what people choose to do at any given time. And therefore, morality doesn't come back to, I suppose, overreaching abstract concepts of good and evil it comes back to what people do it comes back to people's actual actions and is therefore something that is very grounded and um relational rather than being abstract concepts and uh my my personal view would be that in so many situations is is there a good thing to do or a bad thing to do there might be a whole spectrum of less or more or less good things to do um and out and a sort of an outside external concept of good i i'm not sure that is something that you would commonly come across in paganism i don't know if anybody else wants to jump in with that one because um you know, you all have different experiences of paganism. Very long story. <laughs> <laughs> Comedicism has quite strong views on good and evil, and they're a bit mixed up, um, and not quite similar to most of other paganism either. Sure. So, yeah, that's a, that we'll, 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 won't come to that. We can talk about that another time. <laughs> I'm just going to say you've you're posing this little teasing comment there and then disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> you can always find me if you want to talk, know about the comedic side of that. <laughs> I'm easy to find. We might well take you up on that. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments, questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Jennifer, thank you very much indeed for both the talks that you've done. You're very welcome. Were you going to say something like Kevin? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see a disembodied hand doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much indeed for both of the talks. They have been excellent. Um, it's certainly given me some food for thought, and I suspect probably a few other people as well. So on um, behalf of the CFBS... I'm always happy to answer questions or, or chat about anything with people if they want to get in touch afterwards, that's fine. Lovely. And last but not least, thank you all for coming along and taking part this evening. Um, it wouldn't have been the same without you. And uh, hopefully you, I shall see you again for the next one, which I believe is in July now. Yeah, 5th of July, I think it is. And that's Timothy Landry talking about voodoo, secrecy, and the search for divine power, which should be quite fascinating, I think. It's not an area that I've had much exposure to, so I'm going to be looking forward to hearing that one. Okay, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. I should bid thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.
Have you logged off, Jill? <laughs>